I am so excited about this one. <laughs> you you're you're so excited about it that you started pitching me before the show started like three times and then kept stopping. I gotta save it for the show. But then there's this thing. I gotta save it for the show. <laughs> it's gonna be a good one, guys. Uh yeah, I'm I'm really excited. So so let's get into the intro business. Okay. Right I am Corey Kerr. And I'm Joshua Kemble. And this is the Indie Review Show. This is the series where we review the best of indie comics and other media like movies, TV, cartoons, books, and did we mention comics? The idea is that we're pulling back the curtains on our inspirations. Josh and I have been professional illustrators, cartoonists, animators, graphic designers, and we've taught at the college level. And we're getting into the stuff that inspires us. Yes. And I don't know why, but we should probably revise that where one of us... Corey is still teaching at the college level. It sound like <laughs> because, it, yeah, it sounds like past <laughs> past tense. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm really excited about the book today. Um, it is uh, just insane retrospective. It's it's a slightly pricey book, so my goal today, um, and and I get absolutely no benefit from promoting this, unless unless maybe you buy it from uh, from you know the the link on the indie review show site, but that's like 10 cents. And it's, uh, I don't, I, my point is it's, it's an investment that I think is well worth it. And I'm hoping that I'll do it justice because I think it's uh, one of the more important art books. If you're doing animation or comics, I think this is like a must own. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's like, it goes into just straight up the history of comics. So it's called Windsor McKay, his life and art. It's by uh, John Kane Maker. I think part of why it's great is I think John Kane Maker is an animator himself and a filmmaker himself. So, uh, and it has a foreword by Maurice Sendak. So, oh, yeah. like it, it's 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 uh, it's definitely something I'm really excited about getting into. I guess before we get into that though, we should probably do plugs. So, uh, Corey, where can everybody find your stuff? Yeah. Do you want to start with me or start with you so that you can switch over? Starting with you would be better because then I can do mine. <laughs> okay. So, awesome. Um, yeah. So you can find my stuff at CoreyKerr.com. That's C-O-R-Y-K-E-R-R.com. I'm right in the middle of uh, <clears throat> finishing up. Well, finishing up, it'll take me another two or three weeks. Um, a music video that I'm working on. And so if you want to see different pieces of that coming together, you can check me out on Instagram. And uh, all that stuff is at coreycore.com slash online um, where you can see my stuff. And I, I think based on what, uh, based on what Josh was saying at the beginning, before we got started that you should go watch um, my animated short, put your heart into it um, right after this episode. I think, I think that's uh, going to be thematically appropriate. So Josh, how about you? Where can we find your stuff? All right. So uh, you can find uh, two stories, which is this book that you see right here, kindly. I'll, I'll lower it a little bit so you can see the – here, I'll just put it here. Um, this is a graphic novel that I hand write, hand letter, and hand ink, and hopefully can hand to you in print. And right now, if you order it through Amazon.com, it's on sale for like – the last time I saw it, it was like $8.99, which is insane – uh, that's like over 50% off. So I said this on Facebook and I'll say it again. It's like a little over a dollar a year. It took me to take it, to make it. So, um, I, I would say if you're a fan of the stuff we review on the show, uh, definitely pick that up. And also you can just find my work and see where I'm going to be trying to get signings and stuff going, uh, now that I'm vaccinated, um, and it's fully kicked in. So, uh, so yeah, you can keep track of that kind of stuff and news like that on joshuakemble.com. And now <laughs> I'm really excited about this book. Um, first off, it's a lovely book. It's, I, I could not present this in a way where it doesn't reflect. Um, so I'll just show it at like an angle, but, uh, it's, it's a beautiful book. I think they've changed the cover jacket since. So the version you guys might see on like Amazon or something like that, uh, may not be adequate, um, but you'll notice it's Windsor McKay, His Life and Art by John Kane Maker with a foreword by Maurice Sendak. And actually what's cool, and I just learned because I haven't really um, had the time to like fully investigate this book prior to, to kind of doing this review. Um, so it was like 
the last few days where I really was just re-digesting this. And I didn't realize, but like half of the pictures in here were in Maurice Sendak's uh, private collection, which I think is really telling of how oh, wow. um, revered he is by like legends in the field. Um, and then the cool thing is it's a beautiful book. And whenever I, we do reviews of like really nicely printed books, I just want to, you know, point out like it also has like a debossed Windsor McKay, his life and art on the inside under the jacket, which is always like a nice little, uh, little homage. So you get the red and yellow, which matches, uh, the vibe of it. And then we start getting into the book. So, um, this book is like an art book. It's a coffee table book. Um, is my head going to get in the way of, you know, it's kind of covering up. The pain. Yeah. Let me just uh, take my head off of here real quick. Okay. I just was all excited about having the ability to have my head there. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to block this beautiful artwork. So, okay. So uh, there's extensive notes on this. I'm going to time myself and try really hard. But this literally just goes into the entire life of Windsor McKay. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a really important book, I think. Um, just as a brief forward to get people hooked, uh, this is a guy who started um, at, like, basically born pretty poor in, like, Michigan and moved from, like, you know, a poverty-stricken life in Michigan to becoming one of the most famous artists of his time. Um, moving from doing art for freak shows and dime store museums to filling uh, Broadway, having a Broadway musical based on his art, and also just in his spare time, helping to invent animation. So <laughs> uh, pretty fascinating life. Uh, just as a, a little warning, uh, we, we gave this on the last one too. Uh, this is from you know the late 1800s and early 1900s. So some of the depictions of people are just like, pretty inappropriate for this era in time, and they were probably inappropriate at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some slightly racially uh, insensitive depictions of characters that really call back to um, some really bad tropes and stereotypes about um, other people. And so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, that's not to justify it, like saying that it's of its time, it's just to kind of give a little warning that, um, you know, some of this might be slightly offensive, although probably less offensive than our last uh, last crack at Windsor McKay. Um, okay. So we're getting slightly better? Yes. Okay. That's good. Um, okay. So uh, we, we, uh, Adam Moore real quick says, hip hip hooray for Windsor McKay. And Jim Lujan is telling us that Bill Plimpton is a huge Windsor McKay fan. As he should be. And like, what I will say is like, I'm not surprised by that. Bill Plimpton's like a legend in animation that our friend Jim was lucky to do a film with. Um, but uh, anyone doing animation really, I think is probably a huge fan of, of Windsor McKay for what he did in animation. And uh, hopefully if I can do it justice, uh, you'll see why. So, okay, this is a uh, Sendax forward. It's really nice. It's paired with like a great little Nemo and Slumberland page, which was um, his strip and we'll kind of get into that. Um, but uh, he talks about how the night kitchen was mostly done as an homage to Windsor McKay, which is one of Sendak's most famous books, children's books. And uh, that he hopes that this book will bring uh, McKay the recognition he deserves. So that's kind of, and, and he talks about just like the brilliance of his art. So it's a nice little forward to kick it off. Um, and then the preface and acknowledgements are really cool. Um, Kane Maker basically just talks about how he befriended, and this is why this is such a good book to own. Um, he befriended McKay's family and uh, one of his old assistants who helped him on uh, Gertie the Dinosaur and um, a couple other animations and was actually doing in-betweens and backgrounds for him. So um, they gave him access to McKay's work and uh, it, all the way to like original nitrate film of the illustrations, which is really cool. And I learned a little bit, um, Corey, from our last time talking about um, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland, um, where uh, I learned this gets a little bit into the coloring process, which is super cool. So I can actually answer some of the questions we had about like how the hell they were doing that back then. That was cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's the introduction. So 
uh, basically, it starts by talking about 1914 in Chicago. Um, uh, and uh, it talks about McKay releasing Gertie the, design, the dinosaur as part of a vaudeville act. And uh, it's just, this is just like a little teaser. It's kind of nicely, nicely done. And we see that... I will tell you, like this art, this book just for the art alone, like these awesome old timey um, vaudevillian posters that McKay was like such a master at, um, are also really cool. And these are kind of like lesser known things by McKay, but it was a good portion of his art career. So, uh, just that's one other benefit of what you get. So, okay, we get um, basically uh, McKay. Uh, if, this is basically talking about him at 47 years old, um, at the peak of his fame, uh, that he was this guy who really just continued to just have this strange need to draw that helped him escape um, his woes and his problems in life. Um, so once again, it's an overview, and then I will start getting into like how he was born and all that stuff. So um, it talks about overall Maude, his wife, and McKay always have issues with money, uh, and, they, and they're and they going to get into conflicts with that. There's uh, there's his wife um, and his family as well, his, his son and daughter. His son, who uh, Nemo was actually modeled after, um, and then there's McKay himself in his, like, sharp, uh, crazy suit um, in, in Victorian garb. Uh, his favorite work, uh, comics and animation, it later in his life ends up uh, getting taken away from him in favor of Hearst newspaper deadlines. And uh, by age 67, he died of a stroke. Um, and so overall, you know, as you're going to see as I get to go through this a little bit, um, he's a self-taught artist who adapted from circuses, dime museums, humor magazines, um, to newspapers and film. And so it's just, you know, like a, a brief little intro. And then it, the nice thing is this is broken into three phases as a book. So this is the first phase and we'll see how far I can get with my rambly nature. <laughs> All right. So uh, it gets into his Michigan years and this is really crazy. Um, so Windsor McKay uh, has Canadian roots. His like his ancestors uh, lived in Canada and then they migrated to the U.S. Uh, to the mining town of Michigan for jobs, um, which is a pretty common American story. Um, and Windsor himself, like, was named uh, Windsor after the boss in the town uh, named Zenus G. Windsor. So it was the um, his, his father, Robert McKay, uh, liked his boss so much he named him after him. And uh, his father is a teamster. And uh, we start getting this really cool, interesting backstory about how uh, Robert becomes a real estate agent, his father, um, and changed the spelling from McKay with a K. I've always wondered why it was with a C, right? Um, and it was all to avoid a saloon fight. It gets into a lot of cool stories like that. <laughs> but I guess like the McKay clan wanted to uh, get a fourth McKay to go get in a saloon fight. Um, they were like a bunch of Scotsmen, uh, and, uh, McKay dodged out of the fight by saying, no, 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 I'm not McKay clan. I'm M C A Y clan. So that uh, <laughs> back then, that's how you just officially change your name. Uh, <laughs> so he's, this gives you a background in like where, you, where McKay came from. He's in this rough Michigan lumberjack environment that really is not friendly to a young artistic kid. Um, there's a really cool story about uh, Windsor McKay when he's seven years old, his house lights on fire, which apparently was also really common back then, house fires. Um, and uh, right after the fire, he picked up a pane of glass and a nail and etched into the pane of glass like a picture, a, a perfect representation of the, um, the, the fire itself, like it, which is insane. So sorry, that was wow. age six. So um, he could draw beautifully at by age six, and uh, he he had had this amazing ability to do memory sketching, where if he saw something once, he could like redraw it very accurately. Although it's still untrained at this point, right? So although his art blows away the community, his father, very typical kind of art art like dad at the time, didn't want him to waste his time drawing, so he sends him to a, a business college called Cleary's B Business College. 
and uh, what and and when he's 19. And then McKay, like when he's 19 from this business college, starts sneaking to Detroit uh, while everybody else is taking side jobs to kind of pay their rent. Um, he sneaks to Detroit and makes easy money drawing at this uh, dime museum called Wonderland, um, which is like a curio freak show. Um, and so he'd just draw patrons and the carnival barker, you know, would basically like uh, talk him up and be like, this kid will be famous one day and you'll, you'll love this portrait. So that's how he made his uh, living while he was like early in college, like at 19. Um, and, and as he's doing this, uh, there's a professor um, at Michigan State who actually uh, meets um, McKay and takes him under his wing and decides to uh, mentor him. And this professor um, also teaches at Cleary, but uh, he also happened to be just like, just starting to learn a method that he wanted to test on his students about teaching a, a massively based specifically targeting perspective. And for anybody familiar with McKay's work, um, like as a young artist being kind of trained and mentored, like you can definitely see his, the tutelage like they're paid off, right? <laughs> um, so, okay, so there's this guy Goodson who's doing this. Um, and so this is just paralleling it with some of his use of perspective in art. I think the way this book is laid out is just beautiful, you know? So Goodson uh, uh, teaches him hardcore perspective. Um, pers perspective is what McKay views as his own strength. And even quotes, uh, there's a couple quotes where he talks about not being really that great of an artist, but being excellent at perspective. And so he's able to kind of cheat the art. Um, and that's weird to hear somebody like McKay say. Um, <laughs> so Goodson's trying to pressure him to go to um, Art Institute of Chicago. At he, this he point, might be the only person alive that's ever tried to cheat the art with perfect perspective. Yeah, I'm like, that's not much of a cheat. Um, <laughs> but uh, but so Goodson, this mentor, is trying to push him to go to Art Institute of Chicago. And here's where we get into this interesting part of the book and why this book is so essential because this writer somehow parsed between all of McKay's fiction about his own past. Um, like, you're going to notice a few things. Like, they don't actually. He, he is very sketchy about the date he was born. The date on his tombstone is not an accurate date to his birth date. Um, and then it turns out that like he, the date that he stated to the press like changes like 50 times. <laughs> um, and there's some questionable reasons as to why he might've done that. But so there's also things like he said he went to the Art Institute of Chicago and he didn't, right? Um, at the behest of, of Goodson. So. Um, like, I, I love this biographer because he kind of cuts through some of the propaganda that McKay was put, putting out when he was doing kayfabe, which is just, you know, like, that's like fake wrestling, right? Where you like, uh, you, you cut your forehead or whatever to make yourself bleed so that it looks like you just got hit, right? <laughs> like, um, it's, there's a lot of that with this because uh, McKay himself was like kind of a product of vaudeville, as you'll start learning. Yeah. So, so, okay. So now fast forward to 1889. This is a long time ago, guys. Um, McKay uh, goes to Chicago at 22. Um, and, and this explains a lot of McKay's imagery because they're just starting to build um, new buildings after the great fire uh, that happened after the Chicago world fair. Um, and so uh, a lot of the architecture though, after that was very influenced by the Chicago world fair. And then a lot of the surviving parts of the architecture of the Chicago world fair were put in different theme parks that McKay actually had extensive like photographic collections of. So when you look at like the crazy colonnades and stuff in little Nemo, um, it kind of makes a little sense of that, which I think is cool. So he ends up, uh, not going to art school. He instead works for the national printing and engraving company, um, basically making circus posters. And, um, I love this stuff. <laughs> um, but you know, this would be like a job that like 10 artists would work on. You can kind of see the varying styles in the artists, like each, some animals are very well represented. Some are very poorly proportioned and, the type is kind of all over the place because they have like 10 different artists like executing these things. Um, so, you know, a lot of these use hyperbole, uh, like 
crazy hyperbole on the posters to kind of sell the the thing like the greatest showman on earth kind of stuff and ornate illustrations and you'll also see that a little bit reflected in the way he starts uh bringing that into like little nemo in particular um a lot of the vaudevillian influence so anyhow it turns out he lived his roommate was jules guerin who was like a painter illustrator and muralist who grew on uh, went on to be become very famous and he was a co-worker um for this like national printing and engraving company which by the way um one of my favorite hobbies is to look at old engraving companies um and i i just so i i thought it was it was interesting i didn't remember that about mckay that he had done that so that's his 21 year old job um so possibly, uh, it's it's also posited that at this point, he, he possibly joined the fi Freemasons. Uh, they know he was like a lifelong member. His father was a lifelong member. And uh, he was a pretty heavy agnostic and snuck in a lot of um, uh, kind of anti-religious humor into his uh, stuff as much as he could get away with at the time. So even in this, there's like an inside joke that I didn't even notice on this. But it's like when the bed is running through the town, having all this freedom and fun, it gets tripped up over a steeple <laughs> and I didn't even notice that. Um, and I should have, cause that's pretty obvious iconography, but pretty cool. Um, so anyhow, e even jokes about um, uh, the secret rules of masonry, like the fact that you can't reveal the secrets or talk about masonry is like lambasted in it, some of his later strips where somebody tells his wife about it, um, about the Mason's uh, induction ritual, and then ends up getting like offed by some, secret society like a panel later um okay and then uh so 1989 uh to so basically 1989 and 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 all the way to uh, sorry 1980 1889 to 1909 he uh he did this and then started he gets a gig painting signs for a museum and at this time there's like these weird curio shops that are literal like buildings kind of like Ripley's believe it or not type things, but they had like freak shows and uh, they'd have comedians. They were kind of like the equivalent of what like, you know, like now we have movie theaters, but people didn't have movie theaters at the time. So it was sort of like this amusement attraction kind of thing that would draw a lot of people on, on, you know, after work or on weekends. Um, so after two years in Chicago, he moves to Cincinnati um, after cutting his teeth in Chicago for a bit. And uh, um, he, he gets a full-time job working for this Vine Street uh, and Palace Theater Dime Museum. And uh, he does all of their signage and uh, curiosities and like paintings and stuff like that. Um, and there's con contending stories as to why he did that. Um, one was that he was lured by uh, vaudeville, but another was just that it was like a full-time gig and that he realistically just probably got hired full-time by the circus. So um, there we go. That's kind of where we're at. Um, so, okay. So while he's there, um, sorry, he's at this, uh, a, a different curio shop. And then the guy who's the owner of this Vine Street Museum is named John Avery and he poaches McKay from Colin Middleton's, which is the old dime museum that he used to work at. And uh, he, he basically like, we, we start learning at this point, like in his early twenties that um, he, McKay is a really good like self promoter. Um, so he's introverted and self-effacing to most of his friends. But um, he also like, when he gets the job here, moves into the top floor of the museum and for nine years, he makes ads for and painted ads and posters for like weekly attract attractions, like, um, you know, freak show exhibits and stuff like that. And the cool thing is a lot of these are from uh, Sendak's collection, but these are beautiful posters. I didn't realize these were McKay. I think I've seen this one before and I didn't realize like McKay even worked in this. Um, like it, I would love to collect these, you know, is he coloring those as well? Yes. Wow. Um, yeah, and working with like probably a print house and like maybe drawing lines to where they're going to cut their line screen, right? Um, so yeah, so he's basically doing this uh, for about seven years. But what we also realize is that like 
he's branding himself all over the place at this museum. And, and, and really the museum kind of ends up being like a bouncing board for him to like promote himself uh, to get better opportunities and get better known. Um, and he, and whenever he gets the opportunity to kind of get known, like he, he usually takes it and you're going to see like whenever he gets a better job opportunity, he usually takes it as well. He just kind of heads wherever he's appreciated. And that's one thing that's actually pretty inspiring about McKay's uh, story. But anyhow, so Cincinnati is a growing city. His posters like this start drawing visitors. And actually a lot of people like the posters more than the actual museum. Um, and so he becomes like a favorite in the city. And it's also mentioned that the city is super racist, which might explain some of the later artwork and ideas that like McKay kind of snuck in uh, throughout, but they were like a very, um, uh, like white exclusive kind of city that just wasn't open to like integration or anything like that. And, uh, it, I think, I think that had an effect on, on like the way that McKay's work, uh, kind of rift and just sort of treated minorities as if they weren't people, you know? So, yeah. Um, okay, so now we get into Cincinnati, and I'll I'll start zooming a little faster. Sorry, it's super fascinating. That's why it's hard to kind of go through. So McKay works uh, for the Dime Museum uh, that changed his owner's hands. Um, that's where he actually meets uh, his wife. Um, his freak art garters attention to locals. He ends up getting hired by P.H. Morton, who's like a big sign guy, uh, to do signs for him. And um, he starts getting this rumor, and, and this is a bunch of people uh, talk about his drawing ability. And you can actually see it on some of his animations if you ever Google them on YouTube. But he had an interesting style where he would start with like a single line and just create a perfect outline um, of a figure and then just kind of fill it in without like ever erasing or correcting. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> um, so, okay, so this is a little more problematic, but I think this is more just relevant to the time. But um, so McKay meets uh, his wife, Maude, at the dime store uh, that he lives at the top floor of. And uh, he kind of flirts with her. She's 14, which is crazy. Um, now, in retrospect, that's insane. But I guess at the time, it was still a little looked down upon. A lot of people think that might be why McKay kind of never talked about his birth date. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I think he was about uh, 15 years older than her at that point. So they elope. Oh, so, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's brutal, man. 1800s are not friendly. I, anybody who doesn't think we've made progress as a society. Uh, yeah. yeah, read, read uh, a little bit of history. Yeah. <laughs> um, so also people died way younger then too. So, um, so McKay... Uh, so, so um, McKay also ends up married to her for uh, 43 years, but there's this constant expressed reluctance in his life about marriage. Um, and he has an antagonistic relationship to women that, that kind of shows up in his art where you'll notice like when little Nemo's like off on his journeys and stuff like that, he's befriending other boys. And generally the princess is just kind of this filler character who disappears and has no depth or personality. Um, we also find out that they're very economically pinched, um, and that, um, uh, because of that, like the poster art, uh, and the economic needs, um, that he's feeling, uh, lead to him doing newspapers and he starts learning, um, the, how to use a pen and the tribune, the local tribune, uh, offers him a job, um, which he re rejects because he has a deal with this guy, Avery, who runs the Dime Museum. But um, eventually Avery leaves the Dime Museum. And so he feels free to kind of join the Tribune. And he does like really mediocre art like this um, for his like first work for a newspaper in his <laughs> 20s, which <laughs> I'm joking um, is just kind of insane. So, um, so when he gets this gig, uh, McKay is now, sorry, so he's now 31 and he's starting to do full perspective renderings for the newspaper. And uh, um, uh, at this point in time, he's also looking to cartoonists that are out there. Um, like there's one called A.B. Frost, which this is a picture of, who is like a huge influence on McKay. He does these like kind of slapstick exaggerated sequences. 
Um, and he's just kind of putting his guns in all of this art. But um, what we also start learning from this is um, that McKay starts doing editorials for Life Magazine, which are also kind of racist <laughs> um, editorials. Um, but we, I guess there was a conflict with the Philippines at the time. And uh, so a lot of the editorial work was like dealing with our conflict with the Philippines. And, um, and it was definitely, in, uh, you know, uh, conformed to the stereotypes of the time, but this is from time, right? Uh, or sorry, life. Um, but life was, was like one of the few uh, places running like editorial cartoons outside of just the, the regular newspapers. So then we see McKay like really uh, take off um, and uh, and start kind of experimenting more with stuff we'll see later on. Like we're seeing like kind of signs of future animation where there's a piece like this that is talking about like horses versus cars. And it's this whole uh, sequence of Native Americans like basically attacking a car and getting blown up, which once again is pretty racist. And but... Uh, from the standpoint of just like, you don't have comics really existing. You don't have a lot of art forms showing movement and depicting movement in sequence, like sequential art that's showing a, a almost animated sequence. And um, this is just showing McKay kind of playing with the medium. And this is before film. So his choice to do this like long shot is very interesting too. Um, this is from 1903, which is kind of stunning um, considering just the composition, the movement, the fact that you're seeing a whole sequence moving and you're seeing like indications of what where, where like you, you can almost see like how this led to animation. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, it's almost like a storyboard. Yeah. So then he starts uh, at the tribune, like he starts doing just some incredible stuff. Like, um, and like, this is a, illustration that he did with gouache and uh, pencil and ink. And it's like Shakespeare going into a theater um, company at the time called the theater syndicate. Um, and so he starts, but he also starts exploring like consciousness in his work um, when he starts illustrating these slightly racist um, uh, stories by a different writer at the time who wrote all these allegories of like how the giraffe got its long neck. Each one of these will have like three sequences where it'll be like um, some characters in the first panel are kind of messing with giraffes. The second is like the, the animal being fixed, like uh, sometimes by a doctor, sometimes by other animals. And then the third is like the animal with their new adaptation like kind of proudly displaying it. So it's like these gag cartoons from the time. Um, and we start seeing reflections just in the style of like what we'll eventually see in Slumberland, but he's illustrating other people's work. So it's still kind of editorial work, right? All right, let's see here. Got to zoom a little faster. So uh, McKay uh, remembers high risk artist uh, starts doing high risk artist reporting where he's actually a reporter. So he's going to like crime scenes and stuff like that. And then illustrating it really quick um, because at the time photography is in its infancy. So uh, like there were journalist uh, artists at the time. Um, and then that, that thing was called the tale of the jungle imps by Felix fiddle. Um, that, that was the thing looked at. And uh we also start seeing like um, Muka becomes an influence around this time. And you can see like the influence on, on McKay's line, like how he's consciously choosing to kind of move from a style like this, you know, which is like really rendered and kind of traditional illustration to like more of a thick nouveau line. So it's interesting to see that that was like a conscious kind of evolution. So, um, all right, where are we at? Okay. So McKay leaves Cincinnati, uh, ends up uh, um, being introduced. So he leaves his old uh, job at the Tribune and the Tribune actually likes him so much they offer to introduce him to the New York Herald. And the Herald um, uh, basically um, offers to hire him. Uh, and then there's this great quote from McKay. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, 
which is work, work. That's all there is to cartooning, which I thought was really cool. Um, That's so, so second phase. All right. So this is where McKay is going to kind of come into his own and we start seeing the McKay that we all know. Uh, this is an illustration by one of McKay's coworkers of what Windsor McKay looked like when working for the uh, Herald. So Herald Buildings in 1903 in the Tenderloin District. Um, the press room's visible through the windows of the open gallery. It's really exciting to kind of read this stuff. Um, and in two months, he drew, because he really wants to knock it out of the park for the Herald and just, like, uses, like, top guns. So he draws 35 cartoons in, uh, um, uh, in two months for the Herald in the evening uh, telegram. And they're kind of varying in style. Like I think this was his first cartoon. Uh, that's just like an illustration and kind of semi-comic um, about like a local politician. Um, and then he actually starts pitching um, his own cartoons. And that's where we'll kind of get into this interesting business. So, um, okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, so McKay um, rocks uh, all of these political cartoons. He starts experimenting with comics, aiming to get his own strip. And uh, it's it's a new art form. There's like three other guys. Well, there's three guys at the time other than him. Alt Cult, Swinnerton, and Cooper, and then McKay. And Pulitzer and Hearst are, are at this point in a rivalry to attract like um, immigrants and working class a cartoonist to work for their paper because it's like the money grab for this weird newspaper rivalry that's going on between Pulitzer and Hearst. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, like newspapers and comics like that'll come to play a little later, but basically there's a hot rivalry. Um, and the way to kind of get it, like, I guess at the time they said artists were traded like baseball players from like different newspapers and McKay, um, might have even chosen to uh, make it kid protagonists. Like he, this is his first kind of um, character is little Sammy sneeze. Um, and a lot of people think it might've been a rival out out cult who was also doing the vaudeville circuit and uh, basically, yeah. So um, he also pitches these other ideas like Mr. Good Enough, uh, Rich Guy uh, Seeks an Active Life is the idea, and that fails. Sisters, Little Sister Bo fails. Um, these are the weirdest premises for stories for comics. <laughs> um, and then Finish of the Foolish Philippe's Funny Frolics, and that, that fails. And then finally, uh, in 1904, toward the end of the year, he hits on gold with little Sammy sneeze, which apparently was really interesting at the time, but the bit is not that deep. It's just basically there's this kid, Sammy, and every time like mid panel, he's about to sneeze. There's usually something going on. Like this is a tray of gold, or this was like a chess game. And then uh, Sammy by like the fifth panel, like sneezes. And then by the sixth panel, all the adults are angry at Sammy because he just messed up whatever it was by sneezing. And this literally ran for years. <laughs> Same bit. Just like, oh, my goodness. Look at this. Oh, Sammy sneezed. Kick him out. And I it's mean, always uh, like abuse at the end, too. If you, the poor if, kid. you uh, if you ever hear anybody complaining about how, how episodic and, and formulaic things have become, yeah, maybe, maybe that's part of human nature or something. Because that's <laughs> so it runs for two years till 1906. Um, weekly or daily? Um, daily. Oh, sorry, weekly. Um, okay. And then uh, he's uh, also doing. Um, this is like when he you start seeing a little more McKay, where he's like he just straight breaks the panel, which is like kind of insane. I don't think anyone had done that before. And he just continues to do a lot of weird stuff. So here's the other weird premise pre Nemo that takes off. So he's continually pitching these ideas. Uh, he comes up with this idea of the dream of the rare bit fiend. And it's the longest running strip he had. This ran longer than Nemo from 1904 to 1913. And uh, he signed um, an agreement to have an opera and musical with Max Hirschfeld that never ended up 
coming to fruition from this. Um, they, there's a like weird thing where he has to use the pseudonym Silas because of some contractual obligation. Um, and so instead of calling himself by his own name, he has to use Silas. Um, and then the last panel on this is always somebody uh, waking up. So it's like these crazy nightmare sequences. And then the last panel is somebody waking up because they ate Welsh rarebit, which I guess is like ale, cheese, toast, and crackers. Um, so for somehow eating this like weird cheese uh, food like makes people have these trippy dreams. And that's the premise. Um, and then at the end of these, he'd actually even ask people to send him their crazy dreams. So British, uh, British alcoholic based foods. They don't mess around. Yeah. But they also get really horrific. Like, it's funny. This looks like something that could have been drawn in quarterly, like yesterday, you know, where it's like this guy sleeping, which is everybody's nightmare is because you're so vulnerable sleeping and you have like this worm crawl up, like eventually birds start crawling in his mouth. They make a home in there. He can't breathe. He's starting to like suffocate as these animals are just taking over and finally wakes up like, <gasps> you know, that's actually pretty horrific. <laughs> um, and then these weird ones where it's like a hunter who's just like looking for a deer, but he just keeps getting these weird animals. Okay. So little uh, dream of rare bit fiend starts getting really uh, popular. Um, it has some really dark ones where like somebody's buried alive, like a, a, little baby is eaten by a bear. <laughs> like it's just a trip. And then the bear proceeds to like maul the whole family. Um, but then like they wake up at the end. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that bad food. Um, I and then continue to this, this to the, the comic strips of my youth, like Garfield and peanuts. <laughs> it's <just> yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> But then what's cool is you start seeing some of the surreal stuff that you'll later see and also a little bit more playful paneling um, with little Nemo where it's like this guy dreaming about his wife needing a new hat and it's just this absurd hat that is being delivered, but it's like the size of like a flying saucer um, throughout a city and playing with scale and perspective and stuff. Um, or like a whole city collapsing because a kid like trips and knocks over his like blocks. Um, some really cool stuff. So that's an inspiring and uh, worth owning the book for just seeing some of this stuff. So McKay uh, gets on top of the weekly. Uh, he's still doing editorial and other graphic assignments um, on top of doing the weekly. And then um, uh, he comes up with a, uh, Another, in 1905, he's still pitching ideas, even though he's doing this weekly, um, for like the story of Hungry he Henrietta, which is like a girl who just can't stop eating. It's really depressing, actually. <laughs> um, and then he also does this other one called The Pilgrim Progress of Mr. Bunyan uh, as Silas again. And uh, this is just like this weird guy who's like going through Pilgrim's Progress, but he's trying to get rid of a box of his cares that he can't get rid of. And he wears this kind of weird hat. So nothing like, like here he's waiting for somebody who's like, Hey, I'll relieve you of that. And then he, it's like a waiting for Godot. He grows a beard and decides I better just go shave. And then, uh, finally in 1905, we have this, which is just insane, right? In comparison to some of these ideas. Um, it's the first little Nemo in the New York Herald. Um, and he comes up with this premise where it's like this little boy who uh, at the beginning, we have the king of slumberland uh, calling for little Nemo. And then little Nemo has to travel on this horse to get to uh, wonder slumberland and uh, falls off the horse. And then, it, you know, panel when he wakes up, which is the premise of all of these. He has this crazy dream sequence ends up uh, falling out of bed or waking up at the end. So Little Nemo is just a, a huge hit. Um, it's, uh, it's modeled after his son, McKay, which is interesting. Um, uh, so his son, Robert, who's named after his father, uh, was the model for it. And um, it, it ran from 1905 to 1911. And then under Hearst, uh, under a different name, it ran from 1911 to 1914. It ended up going on to have a broad uh, an opera on Broadway. Um, it, it had the uh, first 
animated cartoon uh, had Nemo in it. Uh, it. It introduces people to Slumberland. The architecture is inspired inspired by the Columbia Exposition and uh, uh, Luxembourg, which actually I think you mentioned the last time we saw <laughs> we we were looking at the stuff. So. So some pretty incredible stuff. Here's some of the collections that he had um, in like a stereoscopic viewer of like architecture that he was influenced by. Um, and at the height of, uh, this is done at the height of McKay's skill. So the Herald um, also, it lucked out because it's perfect timing where the Herald was advanced with printing. So they etched on plates uh, using this crazy Bendet pattern. And, um, what they would do is actually like mask out the areas of Ben Day on the color plates that they didn't want to have prints. So these were like custom done plates by colorists. And then McKay, unlike a lot of cartoonists at the time, had specific um, instructions and directions on like the color palettes and how they should go. So yeah, so this is also part of the Herald at the time's color department, which is insane because it's like way more advanced than I think Marvel's color department in the 1970s, you know? Um, so anyhow, uh, how are, we're not doing great for time, are we? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Okay. We haven't gotten the animation yet, but it's... Yeah, yeah. So McKay uh, makes extensive notes. Uh, he inks on bristle board at this point. Um, he eventually uh, deletes the captions and starts playing with the panels, and we see this whole thing go. So I'm gonna just going to zoom through a lot quicker, but these pages are excellent. Um, he just starts playing with the medium, playing with perspective, um, messing with things. Um, let's see. Uh, so in an instable world, uh, like it's always an unstable world in the dreams. Uh, it's based on his son, Robert. Um, and then it's, let's see. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this is also McKay acting out his own fears as an adult, uh, as a kid. And uh, you'll notice that Nemo becomes like kind of mess messianic like later on. So by 1910, he starts using more fantastical reality to actually address reality based um, concerns in, in, in the real world. And uh, that's kind of interesting. So little Nemo goes from being this kind of fun romp to actually starting to have metaphors. Like when he, there's this point where Nemo ends up on Mars and it's this whole, uh, basically like a put your heart into it kind of story um, where it's like the corporate uh, shill runs the whole planet and has destroyed it and exhausted it and basically sucked all creativity out of it. <laughs> it's amazing that he was allowed to do that. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because when he was doing that, it was like the last run before he left the Herald uh, to go work for somebody who literally did suck his soul out later on. Yeah. So, okay. So he does also this new strip called Poor Jake, which is interesting, which is all about this exploited worker where somebody will hire him to do a job. And then while they're telling him what to do, they're pretending they're doing the work, too, um, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> so they're just like... Yeah, anyhow. Um, and then he'll go back to his wife and his wife will be like, well, you must have been really soaked out there. And he had an umbrella while, while the guy that was working didn't. So, okay. So then we have McKay move. I'm going to really quickly um, move through this. Um, so McKay's, uh, at this whole time he's in New York, he's just kind of making a way for himself. And so he's sending letters to his wife and visiting occasionally, but they're still not in New York. So 1903, his wife and kid move in with him. Uh, they get sick of apartment uh, living and end up uh, settling in Sheep's Head Bay at this beautiful house um, in Brooklyn. And uh, and then basically uh, Luna Park and Dreamland are like really close by. They're like uh, local parks that are influenced by the Chicago World Fair. And he ends up having a studio in his house where he can work in his home. Um, and uh, Fitzsimmons, who's a guy who consulted on this book, ends up being like a key assistant on the animations later on. Um, and he's a neighbor to this house. So that's how they meet. So then we have, uh, let's see, there's just too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by, by 1905, uh, McKay asks uh, Harold, the Herald's art director for a raise. Uh, they do give him a raise. Um, and so at this point he's making like really good money, um, like a thousand dollars per week, um, which is a, a wow. really crazy good amount, um, back then. Um, 
So then uh, we have uh, the interest in vaudeville where he gets courted by vaudeville now that he's starting to get famous. Um, and so he starts doing these. It's weird to think there's an era where people go to a theater to like watch somebody draw, but this is definitely how it used to be. And so he'd do these quick blackboard sketches called lightning sketches in 25 minutes, he'd draw like 25 pictures. And uh, so he also does that on top of his uh, newspaper thing, like moonlighting in vaudeville, making about 500 bucks a week on top of what he already makes. So this is Windsor McKay back in the day. Um, this is a little bit more of his newspapers and stuff like that. So, Okay, so then he also comes up with this bit, The Seven Ages of Men, where he starts with two infants, like, drawn on the blackboard, and then with a few lines, he starts to basically age them until they're old and dead, um, and starts expanding the act, and it starts drawing massive crowds, and uh, his fame starting to increase, so he's getting booked at, like, the palace and all these different things, um, and... Uh, so he's creating his strips in dressing rooms and backstage in the theaters and, and then having them couriered to the newspaper while he's doing all of this stuff. And meanwhile, he's never home. So domestic tensions are growing with his wife, um, which will come back to kind of bite him later. So Maud is hanging out with this, uh, uh, family called the Muirers. Maud is his wife. And the Muir husband, uh, there's like a suggestion that she was possibly having an affair. Um, and uh, so then Mr. Muir, who was having an affair with her, like shows up one day at the McKay's and is jumped by like two men that he posits to the media were hired by McKay to kind of rough him up um, to take off. So little side note. So little Nemo ends up getting adapted, going to Broadway, which is insane again. So... <laughs> All these famous actors, what I guess uh, W.C. Fields, like arch nemesis, was cast in it. Um, and uh, so it gets optioned. Four playwrights try to make it. They fail. Finally, in 1907, it gets. Um, they drop $100,000 to stage it, which is insane for the time. I think the most they used to spend on productions at the time were like 30 k um, so that's kind of insane. The cast is like the best vaudevillian actors based on McKay's drawings. The plot uh, is minimized to like mainly spectacle. And uh, yeah, so let's see. So this is like a huge hit. It's on Broadway. Um, so let's see. So so this, uh, this is cool before we kind of wrap. I know it's going long now. <laughs> um, so this is literally... Within four weeks at this point in time, uh, um, he did, Windsor McKay did four pages of Little Nemo in Slumberland. And we're talking full pages. Four pages of Rarebit, uh, the, the, the other comic. Four three-column Dull Cares comics, which was that um, Pilgrim's Progress one. And... Uh, the full production artwork, poster, cover for Little Nemo, the Broadway show. And he's doing two um, vaudeville shows where he's drawing in front of a, 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 a like in a theater, um, a day. And that was four weeks he did all of that. Which makes me want to quit art. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, for his 17th anniversary, he buys his wife Maude a summer home um, in Coney Island. And uh, it opens to good reviews, but it lasts only 15 weeks because they're dropping about 300 K in 15 weeks. Um, and I guess until 1910, it was the most ex expensive play ever put on. Um, so McKay switches to the broad, the, the vaudeville circuit. He starts playing that up really hard. Um, he has his kid like show up to, to these um, different vaudeville acts, like acting like Nemo. I'm just going to zoom through the rest, sorry. Um, so he also decides to make a film part of Broadway acts. Um, and that's where the third phase comes in and it's animation. Should we go a little longer? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I got so fascinated by this that it's hard to skip through it just because it's so good. Okay, um, let's uh, let's take a little break. Yes. And then and then we can do- to help clear your mind and have fun. Apparently Alexa. I think Alexa right. just was like, wait, you want a break? <laughs> yeah. I okay. don't know why 
my automated spy decided to jump in right then. Uh, okay, let me uh, let's let's take let's take a little break here and talk about um, ways to support the show, and then we'll and then we'll come back and do new things. So I love um, it. Let me share screen. And I should have done I should have done this beforehand. That's what I should have done. There we go. Okay. Um, so we'll go here and we'll just go full screen on that. So um, if you would like to support this show, um, then you can go to irsagency.com and you can also click on any any of the links that are on irsagency.com or on the link of this video. Um, and if you would like to, um, you know, buy any of the things that we're talking about or do any of those things, then um, that will give us a little bit of a kickback and it doesn't cost you any more money. And the show is also brought to you by audible.com. So if you would like to listen to books, uh, like for example, I listen to a lot of books while I am making my own art, um, then you can go to audibletrial.com slash IRS. That's audibletrial dot com slash irs and today i would like to recommend the star wars audiobooks i know that's not a single audiobook but there are so many of them um and they're so good and so if i were to point out a couple that would be really interesting um i would i would go with the thrawn stuff or the first from a certain point of view and from a certain point of view is a bunch of like background characters um in in the first movie and, uh, and it's kind of their story. And so it's kind of interesting. There's like, um, from a certain point of view in The Empire Strikes Back, you've got like Yoda and his like bean farming routine on Dagobah and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of like kind of interesting uh, things that are kind of like in and about everything. And so you get different characters. You get the perspective of the red um, R2 unit um, astromech droid that like blows its uh, kind of top to let R2-D2 get taken and why it chose to do that and stuff like that. So it's fascinating stuff. But if you want to do that or anything else, you can get a free audiobook at audibletrial.com slash IRS. Um, and when you do that, we also get a kickback uh, on that as well. So, okay. Back to you, Josh. I love it. Okay. So now we're just going to really quickly touch on like probably one of the more important things of McKay uh, that this book goes through. And I will say just on a book design note, the neat thing is, there is a little flick book, uh, Gertie the dinosaur, like in the in, in the corner. So if you oh, actually cool. flip it, it's uh, you probably can't see it from there, but um, it, you'll see as I'm going, like it's a flip book that actually functions as an animation, which is a cool little touch. So McKay uh, just gets um, his kid brings home a flip book. This is the story he tells, and he looks at the flip book and he goes, "That could be a film." And so uh, now a lot of people cite like there's this uh, group called Blackton and Cole that made, I think, the first of official um, animation picture. Um, there's uh, another one called The Humorous Phases of Funny Faces by Brockton, I guess, that he had that McKay had seen. So technically, McKay wasn't the first to do animation but he was the first to kind of refine it. And so we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. So his first animation is animating little Nemo. And I'm not going to get into like all the companies that hired or anything like that. I'm just going to do a quick overview at this point. Um, but, uh, but what's, what's interesting that you're going to notice, and you can see this on YouTube by looking it up. Um, just like look up Windsor McKay original little Nemo animation. It's unbelievable considering the time that it was created in, um, but anyhow, so he uh, he kind of what he did refine and invent was fluid motion, natural timing, a feeling of weight, like no animators were paying attention to the weight of the figure, which is huge in animation. It's one of the biggest studies you'll do if you study animation, like the bouncing ball. Um, and then individual personality. So like if you watch like Gertie the Dinosaur or any of these um shorts that he did like the the characters themselves have a lot of personality that's relatable and so it makes you instantly engaged um in a way that really animation hadn't done before he also uh created the idea of using registration marks um to film animation uh he he invented the way of testing it with a mutoscope where you'd like um kind of roll through like the different pages to see if they're working in sequence. And then uh, he also um, 
Yeah, I mean, so in Little Nemo, uh, he basically, it starts out as a wager where his friends are at a table, all his cartoonist friends, and bet him that he can't make his drawings move. And he says, in 9,000 drawings, I can have this move. And then we see Little Nemo and all of the characters from Little Nemo and Slumberland move. So he starts hitting vaudeville with this, and it's just blowing people's minds. Um, and so his act with animation is re received well. And so uh, at this point, also William Randolph Hearst poaches McKay, and um, he starts publishing through Hearst's paper, Little Nemo, as in the land of wonderful dreams. And uh, basically uh, the Herald tries very sadly to do Nemo, but just fails because they can't get somebody who can draw like McKay. Um, and McKay ends up uh, win winning the rights to all his stories and characters uh, through like a lawsuit. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah. So, and he's offered like just a boatload of money by Hearst and the freedom. Cause they're starting to give him a like hard time about um, doing vaudeville stuff. So he, he kind of like, once again, you'll see this repeat throughout his life, but he goes uh, wherever he feels like he's appreciated and needed and where people will pay him what he's worth. So the next one is How a Mosquito Operates, which is an insanely cool little animation that he makes um, where it shows this mosquito just like sucking this poor guy dry and doing it in like a cocky kind of conceited mosquito way where he's like sucking the blood from his nose and then uh, all the way until he explodes at the end because um, he's also a very gluttonous little mosquito. Um, and so... He's doing editorials and 27 short-lived week weekly strip ideas that just don't take off. Um, you also start noticing like these little things from his animations, like this looks a lot like Gertie, uh, starts appearing in all of his strips. Like here's the mosquitoes that he's animating. So you can see he has these things on his mind as he's animating them. But at this point, he's more like his heart's kind of in animation. So... Uh, the dream of the rare bit friend though, uh, still is done for the Herald, which is unusual for Hearst. Like nobody knows why Hearst allowed that. Cause usually it was like a exclusive contract. Um, but for some reason he was still allowed to do that. Um, okay. So Fitzsimmons gets hired as an uh, assistant. And at the time it's just retracing, um, from a master background on thousands of frames. Um, and then he noticed that uh, McKay would even animate still characters so that they would have the jitter just because uh, McKay thought that if, if they don't jitter, it's not real animation. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So Fitzsimmons talks about McKay's just always working. Um, the time that he made his animations, this reminded me of you, Corey. <laughs> um <laughs> It, you know, apparently he would like disappear for like three weeks on vaudeville and then he would come back and like just plow ahead on Gertie the dinosaur and then disappear for another three weeks, like doing editorials. And then like he, he definitely worked in crazy fits and starts on his animations. Um, and uh, he also, I forgot to mention uh, at the point of working on this uh, invented cycling which uh, is hugely important in animation. That's reusing already animated sections. Um, he also cre created what he called the split system, which is pretty much in betweening. Um, that was never done before. So prior to this, animators would animate from point A to Z. And McKay realized like, hey, I have my dinosaur kind of in one position here. So I could do it from A to C and then do all the in-betweens there. And then from C to D, when like the dinosaur turns a little bit, you know, like breaking it down into smaller chunks to do the in-betweening, which led to smoother animation, which by the way, Disney totally bit and used. Um, and then also uh, he created the idea of action drawing where to head. So similarly in-betweening where it's like, instead of just drawing your character and just kind of meandering and having them move wherever, you'd have like, okay, I need my character to get from point A to point B. So I'm going to know point A and point B and then do all the in-betweens. That was all invented by McKay. So here's the sad part. McKay's not a good businessman. So he uh, is told to like come up with, um, he's basically told to come up with a patent by like a bunch of friends. And he's like, no, no, no. 
he's pretty much like the old school guy of like um, keeping things in the commons where he's just like, no, like anybody who's crazy enough to do this much drawing should be able to do it. Right. Uh, right after um, there's this guy named Bray who goes and patents. At, so there's this mysterious visit to his studio from a reporter who's supposedly interested in animation where he kindly walks him through all of these secrets and then um, it turns out that that guy was actually um, working for this guy, Bray, who went to on to patent them and also invented celluloid. Um, and so winds up suing McKay um, after Gertie is re released on his vaudeville act. And then uh, McKay ends up counter suing him because he, he's able to prove that he, he made the art before the patent. But uh, he gets like a small stipend from the patent payments for about 10 years, as long as the patent, but before it becomes a, um, I forget what that's called when it's like in the, in the commons. Um, I mean, yeah. So they, they've seen that like he was receiving like very small checks um, from it, but he failed to profit to the extent that he would have had he actually patented all the stuff that he invented. Um, so he comes up with Gertie the dinosaur. Anybody who's not familiar, it's basically like this uh, beautifully drawn dinosaur. And uh, it's an interactive vaudevillian thing where McKay would arrive with like a whip and he would basically be like the lion tamer. Uh, but instead of a lion, he's talking to this dinosaur named Gertie who is kind of ornery and doesn't want to obey directions. And so she does stuff like casually attacking another dinosaur or drinking the entire um, pond that she's next to, but she does kind of comply a little bit. And then at the end, McKay kind of does this trick where he disappears behind the screen. And then there's a live action uh, footage of McKay um, riding the dinosaur off into the sunset. And this just blows people's minds. This is the era when like people would see a uh, film of like a train coming toward them in a theater and they would all run out of the theater in fear because like people just didn't understand motion pictures. Um, so he's snubbed by his hometown paper uh, and press starts disappearing, even though he's done this like beautiful thing that was getting really good reviews. And then what starts happening is all of the press starts disappearing and, and a couple people from the press sort of disclose that Hearst has given a hush order on everything. So Hearst, uh, while he's doing his vaudeville thing, tries to get a hold of McKay, and McKay says he's too busy. And anybody who's not aware of William Randolph Hearst, uh, the movie Citizen Kane was based off of him. Uh, he was not a guy who took kindly to hearing that somebody was too busy to speak to him. So he literally blacklisted McKay from vaudeville um, in response to that, and then basically told him, you can't work for vaudeville anymore. Um, and I don't want you doing animations. So Hearst cancels McKay's, uh, oh, he goes further. He cancels all of his comics. This is like within a month. Isn't this insane? <laughs> um, so he cancels. I wish, I wish I was surprised. Yeah. So he cancels all of his comics, including Little Nemo, um, all of his Sunday comics, which is what McKay likes doing outside of animation. Um, he keeps McKay on a really short leash. He, uh, he, forces McKay to cancel his Pittsburgh uh, event that he already has. Um, and uh, in 1914, he he's kind of strong armed into signing a contract not to take vaudeville work outside of New York. And uh, luckily he did copyright uh, Gertie the dinosaur. And so he signs a distro deal with like, I think a, a, a virgining Fox Um and uh, let's see. Oh, and then there's a blackmail scandal with his wife, um, which is questionable. But there's a husband whose wife is divorcing him and is suing them for $250,000 for her uh, basically enticing and having an affair with her husband. So McKay is embroiled, embroiled in that for a while. Uh, it ends up being thrown out of court because it has no substance. And they, they kind of... Um, it's, it's a sketchy thing, but it looks like it was just this group, this couple called the Lampkins who were kind of, uh, trying to pull a fast one and, and make some quick money. But 
the thing that's weird about it is even though they were collaborating and it got thrown out of court, like there is a lot of suspicion on whether mod was actually um, doing that because it, it seems like through their history, there's some infidelity potentially. So, um, so that's, that's kind of tragic. Um, so Hearst, uh, let's see, this is a crazy thing, but basically Hearst um, uh, starts kind of, uh, create like he actually decides to start an animation firm uh which he hires a lot of people for um as much as i you know think hearst was a beast of a person he was also like kind of a hero for cartooning in a weird way um because you know you you also have uh, george harriman like crazy cat running for you know 40 plus years um because of hearst's belief in comics um but it, but anyhow so uh so he, you know, McKay's at a total low. He's had this whole public uh, fallout um, and Hearst, Hearst stuff is, is pulling a tighter and tighter leech and starting to move him towards like editorial uh, stuff and political stuff. And McKay wasn't really a fan of doing political stuff. And then the Lusitania um, sinks. And so the sinking of the Lusitania for anybody who's not familiar, it's like world war one, very inciting incident where, a uh, German um, submarine uh, shot a torpedo at the Lusitania. Um, and there's a bunch of information that came out later that like the Lusitania was actually carrying a bunch of weapons for war. But at the time that wasn't known. And so to everyone in the U S it just looked like a, a German submarine just for no reason sinking like a, a, a cruise ship full of just um, uh, civilians. So uh, he decides, McKay decides that he's going to um, do an animation based on the sinking of the Lusitania. He seeks permission from uh, Hearst and Hearst kind of allows it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, actually, he's seeking permission from Hearst to work on it, but Hearst actually pays him the extra vaudeville sal salary to get him out of vaudeville onto editorial. Um, and I guess until 1922, he wasn't able to be on stage again. Um, but uh, McKay decides to just self-finance this. So he's not doing this for vaudeville, like the sinking of the Lusitania. So this is a crazy cool animation that I recommend everybody after this watch, but it's like a hand uh, drawn, just kind of insane um, picture he uh he continues some of, some of that some of that was photographs right yeah it's like a mix of photographs but the majority of it isn't and that's kind of the strange part um so the sinking of the lusitania i think the first section is like when it's leaving the bay is photos and then i think the rest of it is literally all hand done um, because they yeah. didn't have a record of it nobody during the sinking looked incredibly photorealistic yeah, it's it's sort of unbelievable, but it's because it's Windsor McKay. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so it's it is crazy, and it's kind of amazing to look at because, like like Corey said, it does look very photorealistic. It's so this thing just blows people's minds when it gets released. Um, it gets released to uh, wide acclaim. Um, he goes on to make three more films that aren't quite as remarkable. They're very cool, like. Um, and a lot of them have been lost to time, which we'll kind of uh, maybe be able to touch on, but I think we're getting pretty far over. No, I think we might have time. Um, so, okay. So the last 13 years of his life, um, basically Hearst just overloads him uh, to the point where he can't do any more animation. Uh, and by 1920, most people in the world forget McKay's animations even exists. Um, by 1921, his dream uh, of what could happen in animation wasn't getting realized. And then by 1927, there's like a gathering of animators um, in New York to honor McKay um, as like one of the fathers of animation. And he just goes on a rant against animation. And he basically says, and I thought this was a good quote. He said, animation should be an art and it's a stupid trade now. He wasn't happy with where animation went. So, okay. 
So the rest is, this is just Hearst being a, a jerk. <laughs> Hearst has him do these beautiful editorial illustrations. I mean, they're like Albert Durer level um, execution. And, and I mean, they're, they're very beautifully. I mean, look at the, the craftsmanship of these is insane, but it's not where his heart is. Right. And then, the art director of McKay this whole time is just like twisting his arm and saying like, your stuff sucks now. Like maybe you should just quit and do animation. And like, they have all these correspondences. McKay's son fights in world war one and his uh, son-in-law. Um, and so McKay also goes through this thing where Hearst gets in deep trouble because they're writing um, artwork, like they're writing editorials that sound sympathetic to Germany and at the time, people get really crazy anti-Germany because it's World War I. Um, and so McKay has to write like these massive editorials like saying like, hey, I've got kids like fighting in this war. I'm not like sympathetic. Like, and I, I will stick with like my employer, but it's like I if I thought he were sympathetic, I wouldn't work for him. He also does these awesome kind of timely um property, uh, sorry, recruitment posters, which I think are always awesome to look at. Just old time army recruitment posters are amazing. Um, and, uh, yeah. And Windsor McKay just kind of starts getting older, um, you know, mentoring under these different people doing these different, uh, things. And then the funny thing is when he's doing these illustrations and his art director is giving him a hard time, um, and he's a, he's unable to relaunch Little Nemo. Uh, so he leaves Hearst and ends up working for the uh, the York the um, York American. Uh, Little Nemo's just not picking up anymore. Like people have kind of moved on. Um, and so he ends up taking a, an offer and working for Hearst and the Nightmare Art Director again. Uh, so the art director, this has a bunch of the correspondences from the art director where he's basically, you can tell he's like literally just trying to piss off McKay and keep him on a really tight leash. And, uh, there's a point where the art director is like so insistent on his contract of not working for anybody. But, um, and this is one thing I think is worth telling, uh, that, that he refuses when like the American tobacco association wants to hire McKay because they love McKay. And they're like, dude, we'll pay you like your year's salary to do like four ads for us. And McKay like asked for approval and the guy's like, Oh, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Hurst. So it, it escalates and escalates and it's put off and put off. And the, uh, the guy who runs the cigarette company finally just gets pissed, goes to, um, the actual office of the newspaper and tells him like, look, um, we're going to cut all advertising funding for your newspapers. If you don't let us have McKay. Oh, and so awesome. instantly the art director just puts his tail between his legs and it's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah um, congratulations, Mr. McKay. They're a very valued client of ours. And of course, of course it's not a conflict of interest. So that's McKay's like one little one, two punch to that jerk art director. Um, but the art director is also being strong armed like that by Hearst because Hearst was a nightmare. So this talks about like how difficult it started getting at the workplace. Uh, they just start cracking down. All of the people who work for the newspaper end up going to this local bar. And there's all these tales of McKay being this just incredible guy who would like, he didn't really drink a lot of alcohol, but he would buy rounds for everybody at the bar. And then he would have them give him a beer um, but still be nursing like his first beer, like the entire night. So by the end of the night, he'd have like 10 full beers um, and be still, you know, finishing nursing is his final one. Um, but anyhow, sounds like a generous guy who like enjoyed other people enjoying themselves. Yeah. He, he also gets known for like a watch ad and stuff like that. But, um, but this is where it gets really sad. Um, it, it basically, <laughs> McKay does these final, this is one of the last illustrations he did. He's doing these final illustrations. He's getting strong armed by this art director. Um, he writes a couple checks to his kids. Um, and then 
he one day just uh, walks up to his wife and uh, has a brain aneurysm and just collapses. Hmm. And uh, so that is like by July 26th. So he drew this kind of strange um, cemetery kind of drug dealer selling tickets to the cemetery as like one of his last things. And then that was, that was it. So here's where it gets really sad. Um, McKay wasn't wise with money. Um, his wife was terrible with money. They like the majority of their conflict in their marriage was over potential infidelity and money. Um, and they had like chauffeurs. They lived like pretty lavishly. Um, but when he died, they had like a thousand dollars in their bank account. Um, and I think their cost of operations was like $30,000 a month. Um, at that point with like the way they were living, cause they had like chauffeurs and like cooks and people buying groceries. None of this like really did McKay even participate in, right? Cause he's constantly working. Um, so he leaves, uh, all of his assets to his kids and his wife. Um, and then it's split three ways. His wife very quickly just burns through their fortune, uh, ends up selling their house from the money from the house sale lives in like an apartment ends up burning through all that money and having to live with her daughter and uh mckay's son robert who's a cartoonist in his own right similarly doesn't know how to live life without like extravagant means and so he burns very quickly through his fortune and uh also a lot of mckay's work is like lost in a fire um and then outside of that the remaining work is sort of passed around and misused and mistreated and finally kind of lands in the lap of Robert, his son who uh, stores the celluloid film in, or sorry, nitrate film in the garage, which anybody who's aware of like nitrate film doesn't store well in a garage. So most of the films turn to powder. Um, and then Robert, constantly is trying to kind of replicate his father's career and be a successful cartoonist, but doesn't have the skill level of his um, dad. And so he winds up um, basically like uh, trying to also reprint his father's work because he does admire and respect his father. And he tries to make them more relevant for their time. And this is going to kill anybody who's a fan and then we'll wrap it. Um, so in order to make it fit, from the large newspaper format to this new format where he's going to reprint little Nemo for a new generation. He decided to cut the original little Nemo inks no. and repiece them to smaller, more modern layouts. Um, and so the majority of original artwork is just destroyed. Robert also realizes he can't preserve these films. So finally he reaches out to a couple of organizations, donates a few. And luckily one of these is uh, found by Walt Disney and Walt Disney in 1955 does a series on the history of animation and meets Robert McKay, Windsor McKay's uh, um, son. And, uh, they run basically Gertie the dinosaur is like one of the most important things in animation, right? After they have their meeting and Robert's there and he's met Walt Disney, Walt Disney actually turns to Robert McKay. And at this point he's at the Disney animation studio when it's ramping up and just, I think pre Disneyland. Right. And uh, he point, he waves his arm at the entire studio turns to Robert McKay and says, all of this should have been your father's. And that is why this is very similar to put your heart into it and why it's a good book and Holy crap. Um, it's this guy should be more known, should be more important. Um, and I hope I did it justice. I'm sorry I went over, but, uh, but I do think it's just a really important uh, guy to learn about. And, and even the animations, there's so much uh, more, but this book just does an excellent job at kind of going over it. And also it will show you the heartbreak of when you get owned by a corporation to the point where they can make you stop um, the, the passion projects. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's crazy. 
Yeah. That's just totally crazy. Let's uh, let's switch let's switch over here. I'll, I'll pull over here. So uh, just a reminder as Josh is, is doing this, is you can find um, irsagency.com has all of the information about this show, uh, including affiliate links and sponsors and whatnot, um, as well as uh, what we're doing next week and the week after. And if you guys would like to participate, uh, we'd love to have you. So, um, all right, we are 90 minutes into this. Do you want to yes. uh, do you want to truncate uh, this next part? Yeah, I mean, all I'll say is like, I, I think we already have touched on things that you can pick up as lessons or like there's a million things you can steal from McKay. Uh, you can steal perspective. You can steal work ethic. Uh, you can steal just consistent uh, love for the medium yeah. um, and and also just persistence and kind of like an absurd um, ability to just keep pushing and making incredibly ridiculously unbelievable amount of work and the fact that it's a human being shows it can be done which to right. me puts the bar really high for all of us cartoonists so that's so that's one thing um outside of that just as a book i was really moved by reading about the interpersonal relationships of mckay and um how sort of you know his marriage had a lot of issues um his family life had some issues Overall, it's just an excellent book and I'd highly recommend it um, just for like seeing a piece of the history of the medium that we all work in. And then also just seeing the variety, like just thumbing through the whole book, you can see like a million different styles and varieties that he was capable of working in. And it's just super inspiring, I think, on that level too, seeing the evolution of an artist. Um, and, I, and I would say like the biggest lesson I draw from that is like, I, I don't want to end up in a point in my life where I'm owned and somebody could make me stop doing uh, comics, like the comics that I want to do. So, yeah. What were your thoughts on it? Uh, it kind of reminds me of Will Eisner as well. Um, they've got a very similar, exceptionally talented, very passionate and very not business savvy, trusting people that they shouldn't trust and, Kind of getting worked over, um, except uh, you just replace vaudeville with the the U.S. Army, and and then you've you've kind of got you kind of got Eisner, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's the 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 thing about the thing that I love about it is the experimentation of it because mm -hmm. it's you know he didn't he didn't invent the zoscope or you know or whatever that thing is called you know like there are flip books before him or whatever, but like it's always always fascinating to me for people to say like oh here's a thing and i do something how can i take the thing that i do and apply it to this thing yeah and all of a sudden you know disney and all of animation is kind of invented um based on that and um i've got a book that i'll be doing that will paint disney in a slightly better light i think than than he shows up in this but um he, but yeah, it's, it, I mean, animation at the time, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, in, you know, talking about perspective to a modern eye perspective is just obvious, but it's obvious because it's always been part of our life. But like at a certain point in time, you know, artists were like, well, what if instead of just putting people higher, if they're further away, if we also made them smaller and if yeah. they overlapped each other and if like, this building that I know is a rectangle, but what if those lines start to converge as it goes away? And then all of a sudden, like people just assume that everybody always did that or that it's really obvious, but like brilliant things, like I bet I could take these cartoons and play them enough drawings fast enough that they'll move. Um, that's like a normal thing nowadays, but like brilliant things seem really obvious after the first person that does it. Yeah. I mean, one I didn't even mention that McKay invented or was the first to do was timing uh, it, to the extent where if you watch Gertie the Dinosaur, like I guess that the guy who assisted him talked about this, but he sat with like a watch and he would breathe in and like look at the time and then breathe out and be like, okay, so that's about 90 seconds. So we've got like about 16 frames per second. 
So for it to go like 90 seconds, I have to do this many drawings and this many right. beats for that timing. He was like the first animator to do that with yeah. time where he was like considering just the rise and fall of the chest of the character and how they would breathe and how that would elapse with time. Some of it's awkward, especially the cycling, because he he like learned cycling. So he goes a little overboard with it where like Gertie will like put her head out of like the cave and then be like, because it's like, I can go back. I can go forward. It's awesome. Yeah, um, the, interesting, the interesting thing about the cycling, it, I, I was watching some of the videos that you posted on Facebook when yeah. as you were reading through this. And uh, he does this incredible stuff. Like the heart, one of the hardest things to do, having a character turn around. Yeah. Right. And so, but he, but he does exactly that thing. This guy walks up to the door and then yeah. he turns away from the camera and then he turns towards the camera. And then he's like, look, I'm going to do it three more times. <laughs> really hard. That took me forever to figure out. So I'm going to make sure the audience really sees it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny because it is overdone, but it's so like, it's just so important for animation. Like, like cycling is a huge, huge revolutionary thing. Like, and, and you're right. A lot of it just comes out of like this. I don't know. Like maybe we could like reuse that because they have to move the other way anyway. So right. why redraw it? Why not just reuse those cells? Like it's just insane. Yeah. But I, I like that 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 takeaway of like the play because i definitely see that a lot and i think it was like obsessive play because i think he was bankrolling and not necessarily profiting hugely off of the um off of the animation stuff like the animation yeah. stuff was just like a money sink where he's like this could be really cool well and and you have to remember like today bankrolling animation is like well i'm gonna pay for toon boom or i'm gonna pay for you know, whatever, I'm going to buy this computer. Back then it was like photographing and developing tens of thousands of photographs on film. And and this wasn't when you could like run down to like your local CVS pharmacy or Walgreens or something. <laughs> it was like, there was like a dark room. There were technicians. Oh, you know? <laughs> I totally forgot that one. There's so many little revolutions that he invented. Um, You know, the pegs for yeah. acetate sheets. Oh, you mentioned registration marks. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. registration marks was first. Right. But then and the then pegs the to get rid of the need for registration marks, which is a tool that was used by animators all the way up until like the 90s. Um, like that was uh, that was developed for sinking the Lusitania, which is pretty rad. So you can even show it, right? Like those probably have the little peg holes potentially. Yeah, these little... These little pegs at the at yep. the bottom of these pages. That was a McKay invention. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. For sinking of the Lusitania so that they'd have an easier time registering because that was the first one he did with cells. So yeah. craziness. Right. It's weird. To me, it's annoying that there's somebody who, like there are people like that that come every once in a while in art or in, in other things. And they they do so many incredible things that you can almost like forget like oh yeah they also did this huge revolutionary thing right these are these are cells from the Little Nemo cartoon the original actual cells nice and not we're not talking like the 1920s one because no, if, it's the, if that the, yeah if this were the 1915 one like Corey would sell one of those and move into a mansion <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, instead of uh, instead of buying them in bulk off the internet. <laughs> yeah, the nineties, the nineties. Um, that is a beautiful like animation, though. That real oh, incredible. But yeah, the uh, the Hanna Barbera era of of animation is not as valued as the, as the McKay. Well, anyway, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good rundown, man. Um, Sweet. Added Sorry, to went over. Great review. And, I'm passionate uh, about it. And I, I, I think um, there's certain guys that I want to get into on this show and McKay is one of them, but I, I, th I feel like uh, you can, you can gain so much inspiration as an artist by looking to the history and what, what built the whole thing. Yeah. Um, cause, uh, cause sometimes when you look back at like the little sticks, like holding everything up, you, you can actually find, like at the roots, like some approaches that like still aren't tried today. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and it can open doors in your mind. Like to me, looking at even like 
the very primitive early versions of McKay's stuff, which is insanely sophisticated for its time, but compared to what we've seen in, like, it doesn't look like a line test from like, um, you know, the jungle book or something, you know, <laughs> but yeah. it's like, if you look back at that though, like it's still like, even as an indie creator, you can be like, huh, like I, I could use that trick. Like there's still some stuff that I think we can pull from it, you know? Yeah. And Jim is pointing out, if you look back far enough, you can see how comic books and animation are cousins. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's very, very true. It's sequ sequential art. They're both, they're both images in a sequence. Just, just a different way to display them. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we are going to move over to maybe a maybe a quicker hangout afterwards and after party on Josh's channel. And so, if you are watching this live, come join us over on uh, Joshua Kimball's YouTube channel. Um, but in the meantime, Josh, where can we find your stuff? JoshuaKimball.com and go to Amazon.com and get. Uh, I don't know if I needed to say .com. Everybody knows Amazon. Go you know, to Amazon, Amazon get two stories. Amazon.co.uk. That's true. Am Amazon.gov. I'm sure that one's coming. Amazon.forest. Um, so, uh, yeah, but but definitely go get two stories. It's on sale, and uh, it's a good book, if I do say, say a moment so myself. So. It is. I'll say it for you. And uh, you can check my stuff out at CoreyKerr.com, and all my newest things are at CoreyKerr.com slash online. Um, next week we will be covering more things and you can see those things at Indie Review Show, uh, which is irsagency.com, the Indie Review Show, irsagency.com. You will not be taxed extra. In fact, I believe you get a tax break, um, if you go to that website. Uh, don't quote me on that, but try it out and see what happens. And we will, <laughs> we will <laughs> That is definitely not a promise, but who, who knows? <laughs> Is this what I mean to say, uh, Corey does not offer real legal advice. He is a young man who is uncredited and just has an abiding love of. Oh, showing. when you guys are on Corey's site, I told him this at the top, and I want to reiterate: like the the first thing I thought of when I finished this was I was like, "This is put your heart into it." Like this 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 whole arc of this guy's life is like summed up by Corey's short "Put Your Heart Into It." So you guys should go watch that because it's really good. It's animated, so it's 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 in that realm and history of this thing, but it, it sums up the whole thing that happened to McKay very well. So if you too would also like to be extremely depressed, go go watch Put Your Art Into It, uh, which is on CoreyKerr.com slash animations. Um, all right, so we will see you guys next week, and those of you that are here with us, uh, join us over on Josh's YouTube channel in about 10 minutes. Yes.